Isaiah said in um, chapter 61 and verse 1, I will speak of the love and kindness of the Lord. And I believe that he's been good to me. Amen. I trust he's been good to you. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want us to open this morning, and as we open, I want to say I am so grateful for the move of God that we had Wednesday night in our missionaries here. It, there was such a great move of God. And I'm so um, honored to be a part of a church that gives the way this church gives. Amen. So um, we have taken on, brother and sister, the missionaries, and um, we will be giving to them as well as the others. And the pictures of the missionaries who we support are in this prayer room over here if you ever want to see those. But I do want to remind you, we have some others that we have been supporting, that we're still supporting, so don't forget your pledges for them as well as you okay. give throughout the month. So I was just grateful for the goodness of this church is, as it is giving. And he, was, whenever the missionary was talking about giving and stewardship, I'm like, well, he's preaching to the choir while he's preaching <laughs> here, right? Amen. I want us to begin with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to have a couple prayer requests. I want us to enter into our worship this, this morning with prayer and our hearts open to what God wants to say to us. Let's just pray together as we're starting this service today. Lord, I love you and I'm grateful for your goodness and your mercy to us. Your loving kindness has been extensive to us, O oh God. Thank you, O oh God, for the beautiful day. Thank you, God, for each person that you have brought into your house. I thank you for each person and the way that you're working in their life. I pray, God, that you would feed our souls today, that you would touch us, that you would give us grace and strength for the journey ahead. God, I pray that our worship would come up before you as a sweet savor, God, that we could worship you in spirit and in truth, and that your spirit would be upon us. God, I ask all of this in Jesus' name, and we're going to be quick to give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I asked Sister Marcia ahead of time if she would mind if we prayed for her this morning. She is um, getting ready, has some health um, concerns, and her husband also, and they're dealing with some possible procedures, and that's never, never feels real great when you're the one they're talking to about it. But we know God Amen. can bring healing. Right. He Amen. can bring healing before the procedure so the procedure Amen. doesn't have to happen. Right. He can bring healing during the procedure, and He can bring you through the procedure. So we're going to pray that God's will be done. Sister Marsha, if you would come, we're going to pray for you. And I'm going to anoint this cloth because, you know, in the Bible, when Paul went, the, his shadow would um, cause people to be healed. So we're going to pray over this for your husband, and you can take this to him. If there's anyone else who needs a touch in their body, I'm going to ask you to come up right now, and we're going to pray together and um, just lift, lift your hands towards Sister Marcia. Pray for her and her husband. His name is Sam. Okay? We're going to pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, God, I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in Sister Marcia's life, God. I thank you, O oh God, for the touch that you've given her. God, you see, O oh Lord, is the situation that they're in, O oh God, and the procedures that they need to have. God, I pray that you would have their way. God, touch the surgeon's hands, touch the doctor's hands, work all the insurance stuff out. God, bring healing and strength and comfort, O oh God. I'm asking you in the name of Jesus. I know, God, that by God, and I pray for Sam, Lord, today, God, that you would touch him, God, that you would undertake in whatever's going on, God, and the, what, they're, what they're saying they need to do, God, that you would bless, that you would comfort, that you would be right there through the whole thing. Bring healing and strength in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.
name, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lord God, praise your name. Amen. Amen. Our Sunday school can be dismissed. And if you have your Bibles, will you open them to the book of Hebrews? God is good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to be continue our study. Today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 3. And I forgot my glasses today, so if I'm squinting a lot, I apologize. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1. And if you want, you can keep your Bibles there because we're going to be looking at it throughout the lesson. Verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word. You may be seated. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That word profession means job. See, 
I don't know about you, but before Christ, I wasn't the way I am today. Now, I will admit, I was young when we came. I think I got the Holy Ghost at seven, seven years old. Hey, that's God's number. So, (laughs) obviously I've changed some, but people can attest and have a testimony, testimonies of when they come to God, they come to Christ, they're not who they were before. They come to God and their whole character gets changed. Their whole character is affected. They're not who they once were. Most of us, I would say, are not who we used to be before Christ. Most of us, even even after living with God and for God for years, you still change. God still has an effect on your character. I can admit this recently. I've been living for God for 26 minus 7 is 19 years. Wow, 19 years? That just hit me. I'm sorry, guys. 19 years. And just in the last couple of years, God's been saying, hey, you get a little too angry. I know I've talked about this before. You get a little too angry. Being around God, being closer to God, our character changes. What people would call normal in us changes. Most of us, this was an interesting thought that the lesson pointed out to me, most of us likely would not have ever met. We wouldn't know one another without Christ. Right? There are so many different, uh, I can't think of the right genre is the wrong word, of people. There are so many different groups of people that come together because they have one thing in common, and that's Jesus. That's what I love about the church. It's not a group of people. It's the people as a whole come together, unified in one name under Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, in 1 Peter 1 and 16, says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Our opening text says, wherefore, holy brethren, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, the heavenly calling. If we look at what Peter wrote in Philippians 3 and 14, it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said again in 2 Timothy 1 and 9, it says, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. And in our opening text, Hebrews 3 and 1, it says a heavenly calling. A heavenly calling, or in other words, between a high calling, a holy calling, and a heavenly calling. It's it's a call from heaven for us to go to heaven. Our calling is not to stay here on earth, amen? Our calling, when, when we get baptized, when we get filled with the Holy Ghost, something changes and we're like, I'm not going to stay here. This ain't where I want to stay. This is not my home. The past things that I wanted, that I, my expectations, my goals in life, they're just a mere fantasy right now because I got something better to look forward to. Amen? A heavenly calling. Colossians 3 and 2 says, set your affections on things above. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. See, I don't want my goals to be purely on this earth. Now, don't get me wrong. I like things on earth. The sound of a Harley Davidson, that's a nice sound. The smell of the meat cooking on the smoker, the taste of ice cream after a long day, there are things I like, but they're they're paling in comparison to what I've got to look forward to. I don't want any of those things to be what I set my affection on, what I purely look at and think, man, I can't wait for that. And Oh, yeah, heaven's coming. (laughs) Right? Right, right. I'm looking forward to the day when I get to heaven. And like the song we sang last week, what am I going to do when I get to heaven? Am I going to fall on my knees? Am I going to sit there just shouting? Or am I just going to be in awe going, wow, this is so much better than any description I've read or heard? Right? Right? That's what I'm looking forward to. Continuing in Hebrews 3 and verse 2. It says, we're still talking about Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him. 
that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 3 says, For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house that was built. Verse 4 says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And lastly, verse 5, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So Christ was faithful. Christ was faithful. He had a fleshly will. He was flesh and bone just like we are. And so he had a fleshly will. That flesh wants to do its own thing. It wants to go the easy route. It wants to do whatever it can, the easiest, best way possible, and do what feels good. Well, there were plenty of things that Jesus did while he was on earth that he had to put his flesh under submission. When he was in the desert fasting, I bet his flesh was hungry, saying, hey, I know if we go this way pretty soon, we'll hit a town. We could just, you know, turn up and get something to eat. I bet his flesh was saying, why in the world are we going through this while he's carrying a cross up to Golgotha Hill? While Jesus was here, he had to submit his flesh to God's will. And he did not seek his own glory. John 7 and verse 16 says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Verse 18 says, He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus came down not to seek his own glory, not to build himself up, not to, you know, he could have held giant healing revivals and had people come far and wide knowing the name of Jesus and he would have done it, but that's not why he came to earth. He came to earth to help the hurting, to make a way to salvation, right? Made a way for us to be saved. Now, if you look at verse in Hebrews 3 in our opening text, at verse Three, it talks about Moses, how Moses was faithful. Moses was faithful. He was to be Israel's deliverer from Egypt. Moses, this man, he was their emancipator, their ruler, and their revealer of truth. Moses talked with God. Moses talked with God. He saw God face to face, more or less. When he came back down off the mountain, his face was shining so much because God's glory was all over him. They had to put a veil on him. He brought down the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone that God had written with his own finger. Moses was pretty awesome, right? He goes into Egypt and he says, hey, Pharaoh, it's me again. Hey, you need to let my people go. This is what God is saying. And Egypt said, uh-uh. Pharaoh said, no way, Jose. So God sent in 10 plagues, wonderful, terrible, miraculous, however you want to look at it. Moses was the leader of all this, and they're finally on their way out. Am I jumping ahead of myself? I might be jumping ahead of myself. No, I'm, I'm doing it right. He listened to God in the times of trouble. When things were going rough, Moses was there saying, God, what do we need to do? I'm ready, I'm willing, let's talk. What do I need to do? What do we need to do? What do I need to tell the people? He was there standing the gap when God was ready to wipe out the children of Israel. Moses is saying, hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa. you really want to do that? Think about this. Moses was there for the people. Deuteronomy 34 and 10 says, There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses was pretty awesome. Moses was remembered and honored well. People, even into the first century A.D., about 2,000 years after he had died, maybe, give or take, might be a few less. Moses, people had uh, been proclaiming to be Moses' disciples. And Moses' name is mentioned over 700 times in the Bible. I'm probably getting close with this just this morning, just saying it over and over and over. But 
just like we read in our text, the house does not get more honor than the one who built the house. You've got an architect that draws up plans, that looks at how it's going to be built, the, the way the corners are going to have to meet, the way the electrical and the plumbing and the HVAC and the security systems and the, the fire, the, the smoke detectors and everything, and how everything's going to be put together, and the sink's got to sit this high, and the recept's got to sit this high, and the air conditioning is going to be sitting over here, and the roof is going to be at this angle, and everything matches up and just lines up, and you look at the house and you say, wow, that's amazing. Who gets the glory for making that look so amazing? Everybody who built it. The people who built it. Just the same as we look at Moses and we say, wow, Moses was awesome. But who made Moses? You don't give more honor to the creation than you do the creator. Yeah. Right? And that's what right. the writer of Hebrews is saying here. You don't give more honor to Moses than you would to Jesus. The writer is telling the Hebrews, Moses was awesome. And everybody agreed with that. Moses was pretty cool. He was an all right kid. Moses was still just a part of the plan of creation. Yeah. Or he was just still a part of creation. Right. Jesus deserves all honor and glory. Yeah. Right? Now, if we continue, we left off in verse 5. If we jump down to verse 8. This is where the writer of Hebrews goes into more of a warning and tells the people to take precaution. He says, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Verse 9 says, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they always do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, provocation in verse 8. It says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. He's talking about when the Israelites were in the wilderness. Provocation is to, I googled it this morning, it's an action or speech that makes someone annoyed or angry, especially deliberately. Or in other words, if you say something to annoy or make someone else angry. That's provocation. So the Israelites, what did they do? As soon as they, they, saw, they saw God moving, they saw the, the Nile be turned to blood, they saw frogs and locusts, and they, they saw God moving like crazy. And then they're on their way out of Egypt, they've been praying for their deliverer, they've been praying for a way out of Egypt, and finally it's happening, and they're getting caught. The Egyptians are coming back saying, you know what, let's kill them all. Bring them back, kill them, let's get rid of them. And God says, okay, and parts the Red Sea, and they walk across the Red Sea, and they're in the desert, and things are going really good. And the people, all of a sudden, start bickering and backbiting and complaining about how terrible everything is because they want some vegetables. That sounds awful. I don't know if I will ever be so sad about not having vegetables. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So they do all this, and they start talking bad about God. They start talking about God's leadership. And God says, hang on a second. Did you already forget what just happened? They had just crossed the Red Sea. God had just done miracles. And almost immediately afterwards, they started bickering and complaining, and their lack of trust in God... They did not trust God like they should. Their lack of trust in God led them to saying things full of harsh criticism. Led them to where they wanted to go back to Egypt. Uh, doo -doo -doo. No, the lack of trust in God did not allow them to enter into the promised land. The entire nation of people, the entire nation of Israel, had to wander the desert for 40 years. Let the old generation die off. Get rid of the people who didn't believe. They wandered in the desert. But what's interesting is that God still took care of them in there. While they were wandering in the desert, they had food, they had water, they had clothes on their back. God took care of them even while in the desert, even while they were wandering, even while God was saying, okay, we're going to have to wait. You can't go to the promised land yet. 
He didn't once just completely say, forget it and forsake him and just let him took care of him through that whole ordeal. The entire time they were wandering. If we go to, if we continue in chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed means to pay attention. Listen up. Take heed. Hey, this part's important. Listen here. God has made us an offer for salvation, but there is a time limit on it. Now, a lot of times that time limit is your own life. Who knows how long we're going to live? I don't know what tomorrow brings. Tomorrow's not promised, right? And I'm not trying to be bleak and I'm not trying to scare anybody. But we also got wars and rumors of wars, as in the end times. I don't know how much longer we have on this earth. Our time is limited. God has promised us this salvation, but there is a time limit on it. And the problem is, we live in a generation that there are a lot of voices that are trying to get our attention. Now, I'm going to be completely transparent about this lesson. This lesson was written about 20 years ago, the early 2000s. Now, I don't really remember the early 2000s, how many voices there were. I'm talking social media and things like that. I don't, all I know is it has gotten a lot worse. It has gotten a lot worse. And so I say that, and what I mean to mention is that this lesson has aged very well. Its warnings are still true. God's word is still true today, amen? So I say that we've got a lot of things. We've got apps that are listening to you while the phone is, you know, off, set down. It's listening to you so that way it knows what better ads to put it before your eyes. It listens so that way it can, and I'm not trying to go into conspiracy theories. All I'm saying is when I start talking about tacos and then up pops an ad for tacos, that's a little vague, but a couple of you are nodding your head. So I'm, I'm going to, it does. Like green cars, green car. Okay, I'm hopping off that topic. Worse, our flesh. That voice has always been there. That voice is always trying to trip us up and get us to, you see, our flesh wants to do what's easy. I know I said this before. Our flesh wants to do what's easy. And so a lot of times when we're doing something hard, like waking up early and praying or fasting today or a lot of, you know, man, it'd be so much easier if I could sleep in on Sundays. I'd feel like I'm rested and ready to go for the week. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one, am I? And so our flesh, a lot of times we need to say, hang on a second. It's not your time to speak, right? right? Or this one's a very touchy subject. How about our family? That voice. There's sometimes... I know I've got family that think I'm an idiot for coming to church. I love all my family. They love me, but they think I'm an idiot. There are people in my life that think I'm an idiot for going to church. There are, there are people even saved, and I'm not speaking about any of my family here, but there are people that even saved can speak the wrong thing into your life. You need to be careful of what voices you're paying attention to. Be, be discerning. So... We live in a generation that many voices are crying out for our attention. The Bible says in Revelations 2 and 29, He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. Guard against the heart of unbelief. Our verse 12 says, guard against the heart of unbelief. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. See, the heart of unbelief, God can do, God can do anything. God could do anything to a person. He could come down and he could smack them across the face. He could put up a giant neon sign. He could come in, have angels pick up his car and put him in Tokyo. He could, (laughs) there are things that God can do. But if a person is not willing to believe that heart of unbelief, None of it's going to do anything. It's just noise. I've got a coworker, and he is a very blatant atheist. He's respectful. He's not, you know, 
belligerent or anything to people who believe differently, but he speaks his mind. And for that reason, he's probably one of my favorite coworkers because I never have to worry about what he's thinking. <laughs> and I say that with all kindness. I, I hope you see this someday. And so I say that to say he says, he just said it this week, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in a God. There's nothing out there. I only believe in proven science. And I stand back and I think to myself, well, hang on a second. If you believe in proven science, you know science proves that there is a God, right? <laughs> right, right. There have been more times that science has proved there is a God than not. And you want to tell me you believe? That don't make no sense. But the reason is, he's got a heart of unbelief. He's got a heart of unbelief. That unbelief in his heart will not let him believe. It won't let him see that there is a God. Because he's got his mind set up. His heart is made on the way it's going to be. That heart of unbelief. And so the writer of Hebrews is warning us. That heart of unbelief will pull us away from God. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Right? You need faith, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. If someone does not believe, it doesn't matter what God says or does. They're not going to believe it which is why we're being warned about it. A heart of unbelief is a faith killer. It is a faith killer. And in turn, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right? Eventually, a person that does not believe is going to completely turn away from God. Shut all the doors and windows. It doesn't matter what a person is going to say. Hebrews 4 and 2. I'm jumping ahead. Don't tell anybody. Hebrews 4 and 2 says, For woe unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. It didn't do them any good, because it was not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The problem is, doesn't matter what gets said, doesn't matter who says it. It could be the most important person in the world, or somebody who doesn't speak a lick of English, Talking in tongues. If a person does not have faith, the word preached is not going to do them any good. The word of God is no good to us unless we have faith. It'll pull us from God, have an unbelief. Keeping faith. How do you keep faith? Read God's word. Look at testimonies. There are testimonies upon testimonies. There are testimonies in this church building. Amen. After church, you could go up to probably anybody and say, hey, what's your testimony? Mm -hmm. right. Right? right? My testimony is I've never tasted alcohol. I've never had the feeling of drugs in my body. I am very thankful for that. And I'm not trying to downplay or downgrade anybody else. I'm not making myself better in any way. But that's my testimony. God has kept me from those things, and I'm grateful for that. I really am. But you go to anybody, ask them their testimony. What does, what does sharing your testimony do? It boosts your faith. And you got to remember your testimony, amen? you got to remember yours because that is what you're going to have to rely on. What God has taken you through and brought you out of, amen? amen. Hebrews 3 and 13, continuing on says, but exhort one another daily while it, is be, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort to one another daily. Or in other words, lift up one another. You need to talk to one another. See, we're responsible for one another here. We're responsible for each other, right? And I'm trying to think of if I want to do this. Matt, can I borrow you? John, Leah, can I borrow you? If we come up here. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but they're here, so I'm going to use them. <laughs> if we stand in a circle, if we stand in a circle like this, okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to represent the church, okay? So as the church, if somebody starts falling, and it could be backslided, it could be depression, it could be, you know, just anything, anything. A lot of things are not sin, just people go through stuff, right? So, okay, Leah, if you start, act like you're going to fall backwards, right? Okay, and I come here, and then all of a sudden, Matt starts falling backwards, and I'm trying to help him up, and, and, and sorry. yep, yeah, that's exactly it, and I'm doing this, and then John starts falling backwards. 
that's a lot of job for one person to do, right? As a pastor, that's a lot of job for one person to do. But if we link arms, if we're standing together, Leah starts to fall back, right? There's two people. If John starts to fall back, we got two people. If Matt starts to fall back, amen. Thank you, guys. So I bring that up to say it's not just the pastor's job to help out one another. We're here as a group. We're here as a family. We're here to lift up one another. Amen? Amen. If somebody calls you saying, hey, I'm having a problem, will you pray for me? That doesn't mean, oh, this is some good gossip. Right. Right. And I'm not saying anybody does that. Right. This is something, that, that's the time that you say, I'm there with you. I'm here praying for you. Amen. Let's do this. Right? If you feel like you need to be praying for somebody, do it. Amen. If God lays somebody on your heart, especially if they're in the church, it's okay to text them, call them, say, hey, I'm praying for you. Amen. Amen. That's our job. That's our job as a church. We're here to lift up one another, not just to see each other on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, say, hey, love you. You look good today. That is nice. I like being complimented. But the church is not just a Sunday, Wednesday. The church is here all the days of the week. We're here together. If one of us is struggling, the others have to lift up. When I'm struggling, I know I've got a church praying for me. Amen? Amen. Do, 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 do. Sin is really good at tricking people into believing it's only a little. Only a little won't hurt, right? Oh, did I jump ahead? No, Hebrews 13, deceitfulness of sin. The The end there, deceitfulness of sin. Sin's really good at tricking. Saying it's just a little, right? That little white lie, that's not going to hurt, right? Our flesh is weak. How many times can I say that this time, today? Yeah. Our flesh is weak. It wants to do the most easy, the, the best thing that feels good. And oftentimes, if we let our flesh make those decisions, it's going to trap us in something. It's going to trap us in something that... We don't want to be in. That's going to be more work to get out of. Amen? Speaking from experience. If we listen to our flesh, our flesh is going to pull us into sin. Because sin feels good. And the next thing you know, it don't feel good. But it can't see that far ahead. All it's thinking about is the here and the now. And I want to gratify this right now. And i got to take care of this little, little thing. It's just a little thing. Why can't we just do this little thing, right? Let's sleep in another five minutes. It's going to be okay. We don't need to pray a whole 20 minutes, do we? <laughs> safe crackers. Back before it was biometrics and keypads and everything, safe crackers would actually use sandpaper. The real, real good expertise ones would use sandpaper on the ends of their fingers, shave down that callus, shave down so that they would be able to be more sensitive to it. And from that, when they're twisting the knob, they're able to feel that click. They're able to feel the tumbler drop into place, and then they know the other way. And they're able to feel that because they don't have that callus. Now, I got a little bit of callus on my hand. I know there are plenty of us in here, no matter what you do, you've got a little callus on your hand. And that's natural. Your body puts that to protect it. If you're doing a repetitive motion or you're grabbing something a lot, your body is going to get a little bit tougher skin there to protect it. Totally natural. The problem is, is when that happens to our soul or to our heart. When When we start getting callus on our soul and our heart, When God starts speaking, it's hard to hear. God starts speaking. It numbs God's call. Or even the voice of others. It numbs that voice when somebody is trying to help us. And the only help for this is repentance. Acts 11 and 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then God... Or then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So, last verse we're going to be reading out of chapter 3 today, verse, verse 14. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. To the end. 
hold on to Christ. Hold on to Christ until the end because there's a lot of good stuff coming. And I'd hate to be the person that was living for God up until the last day and I thought, you know what, I don't want to do this. I turn away from God and then he comes back. Man, that would be disappointing. <laughs> Wouldn't be worth it at all. Wouldn't be anyway, but you know what I mean. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years due to unbelief. The unbelievers were excluded from the promised land. They were not allowed in. Now, how much of a bummer would that be? Unbelief causing, causing, you've been hearing about this promised land. You've been hearing about God's deliverance. And then because you didn't fully believe, God says, no, you're not allowed in. Man, that would be a bummer. That would be no good. These lessons from the Old Testament are warnings for our church today to avoid the same pitfalls of unbelief. We're being warned to not have unbelief. We're being warned, make sure you have faith. We have the same promise. God's gone to prepare a place for us, amen? We need to be careful and guard against an evil heart that's deadened by unbelief. We need to encourage one another. Show one another to salvation. Show, just out beyond these four walls, we need, we've got people that are hurting, that are hungry, that are looking for God. Amen? Amen. If we could all stand. <laughs>